gender equity, um, as Lorena just discussed, is not necessarily about just women, and uh, gender equity in coffee supply chain development is not about women's coffee or, or women in coffee initiatives. Uh, what we've been doing with the Partnership for Gender Equity is really to identify and understand the differences between men and women at the smallholder level and how these, um, how these differences either enable or create a barrier uh, to participation in coffee market activities and how those differences also enable or create a barrier to um, receiving the benefits or the incentives that, that we try and transfer through price premium programs or, or some, things like that. Ultimately, this research um, is just very preliminary. It's very uh, qualitative and doing literature review and doing participatory workshops um, to affect the overall strategy of the program and to um, start to define what it is that we need to define, uh, what it is that we need to measure, and what we think is going to have positive sum outcomes for our value chains and our business strategies, um, but also how gender-inclusive strategies in our supply chains uh, will actually impact the communities and families in which we're trying to partner with. So how are we going to integrate these differences between men and women in our, in our um, business strategies in order to um, affect livelihood outcomes at the, at the smallholder level? So today I'm going to be talking about what those gender-based constraints are um, based on the gender equity and, and women empowerment in agriculture. Um, talk a little bit about what kind of negative effects they could have for our supply chains and how we can leverage our position as lead buyers and value chain influencers as certifying agencies or um, agricultural finance organizations to, to actually achieve these outcomes for our businesses and for the communities in which we're working. Um, so I have two hypotheses, and um, those are that first, when we are not considering these differences between men and women in our incentive programs and our investment strategies, um, we really are kind of pissing in the wind a little bit. And I can say that because my friend Wendy told me that I could. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's counterproductive, it's causing ne negative consequences for our sourcing goals and business efficiency, um, but by not considering those differences between men and women at the smallholder level, um, through our investment programs, we are actually um, amplifying these constraints and, and the barriers to participation for, for women, and participation not only in the coffee market itself, but um, participation within their own communities and their own families. So we're just reinforcing some of these, um, some of these socially constructed barriers, um, which is problematic. So, what I want to start with is kind of a reconceptualization of how we think our incentives and investments are working. If we take just a sort of a classic microeconomic example of a, of a family farm, and we think that, you know, it all starts with the different factors of production that, we're, that the individuals are putting into the, the farming system, right? Their land, their labor, or their capital. And what they're doing with those is trying to achieve a certain output. Output could be quality, it could be quantity, um, it could be certification standard that adhere to a certain type of market, right? And so they, they have this output, they participate in a market, they receive benefits from the market, whether through price premiums or social um, impact standards, or they receive outcomes in environmental impact and, and outcomes. And then those transfer back into the farming system, right? So let's say that I'm a, I'm a coffee roaster and a coffee buyer, which I used to be, so this is kind of an example from my past. And I think, well, I'm working with this farm, and they only produce 10 bags of coffee, and it's, um, it's something that I want to pay $5.75 a pound for, because I think that it deserves a, a price premium, it's a, it's a Pacamara, it's 88 scoring coffee, it's got really interesting notes. And I think, well, if I'm paying them this, this price incentive, then they're going to reinvest it in their farm, and they're going to be able to upgrade their machinery, they might be able to upgrade their farms in general, and... Um, renovate or send their children to school or, or buy new products for the household um, and be able to have better livelihood outcomes, which will then filter back into the farming system so that they can continue to produce that quality coffee, right? That's how buyers think a lot. Um, or you could be a development organization and say, we're going to, we're going to impact 5,672 uh, smallholder farms through four cooperatives, through um, what we're calling a, a process upgrading strategy, or we're doing high yield seed technologies, we're going to increase the yield by 25%, we're gonna have better incomes for everybody, and it's all gonna be good, right? And we know that this is how it works because we know that 
Household and farming systems are unitary models, right? We know that um, everyone has access to the same benefits and everyone has a say in uh, the decision making about agricultural production and how income comes in and out of the household, right? We know this because this is how it works in our own households. Just kidding, right? That's not how it is. So we need to start changing the assumption to, to really accommodate the fact that um, households are composed of individuals. Right? And these individuals have socially constructed rights, resources, and responsibilities. And if we're not considering the different risk profiles, the different access to assets, the different expectations, and the different opportunity costs, again, we're, we're just being counterproductive to our own sourcing goals and business efficiency, and our own strategies for improving the livelihoods of the farming base uh, with which we're working. How do we really measure this? Right? It's really difficult. A lot of it is really con contextually specific. Um, well, you really have to start with a well-informed analysis of the um, organizations and the, the cooperatives and the communities in which you're working. And the, um, in 2012, the International Food Policy Research Institute and USAID and a couple of other organizations um, really got together and, and uh, published the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index. I'm not going to go through the index with you, but it has a list of indicators um, that, that show improvements or, or um, areas where improvements are needed to um, help women and men and families uh, reach their livelihood goals by understanding where the, where the gaps are, right? Whether or not someone has access to assets, whether or not they can control those assets and receive benefits from, from the rents, from selling milk, right, if you own uh, cattle. Um, whether or not uh, men and women are contributing different labor or they have different time investments, um, whether or not they have decision-making over the income, and whether or not they have decision-making over agricultural production in general, if they need to diversify, and who's making those decisions, and how men and women differ um, in their ability to participate in, in social networks. So these are really important indicators for our coffee industry to start thinking about when we're planning our um, incentive programs and investment projects, right? Because all these individuals have different socially constructed rights, resources, and responsibilities. Like, this is not biology. This is a, a, these are socially constructed rights, resources, and responsibilities. So if you think about control over and access to assets in coffee communities, Lorena discussed a little bit about the, uh, the percentage of, of land that women own. Right? Arguably, the most important asset for coffee production is land. Uh, the FAO estimates that about less than 20% of land, arable land in sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and East Asia are owned by women, whether for, as individuals or in joint land title ownership. And this is an issue as you can see, that all of these, all of these domains are really um, interrelated. So, right, this is an issue for uh, the ability to have bargaining power, to the ability to have say over what type of um, agricultural technique they're using, or the amount of time that they're going to put into it, or how much they're actually being uh, remunerated for, right? So, what is the return on investment? Other assets to consider might be intangible ones, as uh, Lorena talked more about human capital, um, access to uh, nutritional outcomes and, and uh, education. Other assets might be productive assets. So if we're thinking about doing improvement projects with our, with our smallholder communities uh, at the supply base, what kind of uh, productive resources are needed? What kind of tools, technologies? If we're not considering these, and we're asking for uh, expansions of, of time allocation and labor and, and needing to use certain resources that women aren't necessarily allowed to use, but they're the ones that primarily perform those activities, this is an issue for our programs, right? Labor allocation, as I just mentioned, um, is a really important aspect for us to consider because um, if you look at your different uh, the different contexts in which you're working. Um, communities have, you can pretty much generalize the, the type of roles that women and men are playing in uh, coffee productive activities, right? So in some communities, uh, women might spend 70, uh, might do 70% of the coffee production activities before it's sent to market. They might be um, doing most of the uh, fertilization, they might be doing most of the pruning. Uh, these, these activities might be the ones that are closer to the home. Um, 
And then speaking of the home, uh, when women are performing activities in the coffee field as informal labor, that, those activities are bookended by the increases in labor that they need to perform in the household, right? These are also socially constructed uh, di divisions of labor. So when we think about the increases of, of time that we're asking uh, individuals and, and farming systems to spend to produce the type of output that we want to buy, these are really crucial indicators that we need to understand. And they're different, right? So twin released a study um, last year that in the, their population that they were studying in, in Uganda, 70% of the agricultural activities were done by women. But all the marketing was done by the men because coffee is typically seen as a man's crop. So the men were getting remunerated for the coffee. They were the ones that were, getting, that were receiving the income and revenues from the coffee productive activities. But the, the individuals in the household that were performing the informal labor were not getting paid. This has really crucial impacts for when we're doing cost of production analysis, right? So what kind of variable costs are we considering? What kind of, how are we filtering in the opportunity costs between men and women? If women's labor is considered informal or hidden, this is going to have a huge impact on the way that we're conceptualizing what the sustainable cost of production actually is in different contexts. Decision-making over income, as I just mentioned, is, is crucial because a lot of times the people that are performing the labor are not the ones that are receiving the trainings, the ones that are receiving the income and the price premiums. So this has a huge effect on our incentive transfer, right? If I'm paying $5.75 for a high-quality product, and when I go to the, the mill or the washing station, I'm only meeting with the person that's delivering that product, and I'm not meeting with the people that are in charge of the, the aspects that lead to the overall market articulation of, you know, whether it's in the drying process or whether it's in hulling or picking. This has a huge impact on whether or not these farms are actually adopting our standards that we're asking them to do in order to produce the output that we want. Decision-making over agricultural production, as I already said, um, has, has the, the impact of whether or not they're adopting the standards in general and whether or not they have return on investment from increased uh, production activities. But social networks and leadership in the community is crucial because the ability for women to interact in public spaces between, you know, with, with other men and other women those are different contexts throughout the world. So we found in Colombia in our workshop that, that women were more allowed to interact with men in the space. But in Uganda, that wasn't the case. In eastern Uganda, we had um, a lot of discussion over the fact that women were not socially accepted to interact with other men and other women in training spheres that there was um, not a lot of time that was available for them to participate in, um, in, in cooperative activities, to go to trainings, that, um, that if membership requirements for cooperatives, right, cooperatives which provide really important benefits for the horizontal coordination and the resource sharing and the, and the networks, the support networks, if you don't own land, can you be a member of the cooperative? Can you be a full participating member? These are questions that we really need to ask ourselves when we're trying to impact entire communities through our price premiums and our investments. So what do we, what do, we do about that? Like, how can we actually leverage our position in order to um, eliminate some of these barriers or at least cause no harm, right? So I've already said that if we're not considering these differences, we're actually imposing or reinforcing or amplifying these constraints. Well, we know that it's inevitable that we're going to be investing in these communities. We know we need them to adopt our strategies. We know we want them to adopt our technologies in order to produce the product that we want. And I don't need to show you some conceptual matrix of, of why that's important or why that, that's a given that we're going to invest, but I have a really cool matrix, and so I'm going to show it to you. <laughs> so in value chain development and, and analysis, we kind of break down different value chains according to three different criteria. And those are the complexity of the transactions, the ability for the supply base to codify or adopt or integrate the standards that will lead to those transactions, and the capabilities of the supply base to produce that output in general. 
right? So that's all the resources that you need and all the time and X, Y, Z. So, so we know that coffee is really complex in the transactions. We're asking them to produce a really complex product, and it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of labor, and it takes a lot of knowledge. We know that our supply base is 75% of the coffee that is produced in the world is produced by smallholder farms, right? So these are, are in regions that are um, really resource poor, that are remote, there's not a lot of knowledge, there's not a lot of access to information about our markets, and which is why we invest so much in market access programs and, and capabilities projects and, and upgrading projects and capacity building initiatives. You've all heard the words. So hierarchy, a hierarchical system is okay if you work in the electronics industry or if you work in apparel. Um, to the left, you'll see that there's this continuum that says high to low, and that's the level of power asymmetry within the value chain. That's the level of coordination that's needed. Coordination should bring to mind uh, that, that your transaction costs are going to be higher, that your investments are going to be higher. Right? So if we're investing in these capabilities programs to move to a system where... Um, where we're able to change our suppliers a little easily, they're able to codify in a different way, um, a little more efficiently. And the power asymmetry changes. That's a benefit for everyone, in my opinion. I was talking to a, a farmer, a producer friend of mine last night, and she was explaining, if, if I'm selling my container to this company, and they reject it, that's fine, they can, all, they can always pick up a spot. But if he rejects my container, I'm screwed. Right? And so that's the level of power asymmetry that we really start to consider. So when we're interested in these supply chain development projects, we have to start considering whether or not we're, we're actually enforcing these standards, whether or not we're doing something that's a little more uh, well-informed and contextual analysis in order to do no harm, and whether or not we're actually trying to eliminate these constraints. So I just want to leave with one thought. Just We'll use this as an example, and you can start to consider how you can ask these questions in your own programs. But when we're talking about process upgrading, or we're talking about product upgrading, and, and we want to improve the quality or reduce the per unit cost and improve the efficiency, when we think about high yield seed technologies, for example, uh, we have to start considering who has access to these formalized seed channels. What are the traits that are actually going to benefit the people who are performing the labor? Um, and what kind of resources do they need? How are we going to properly incentivize individuals to adopt these strategies? And the same goes for anything that's quality related, anything that's experiential related, anything that's certifiable or credence standard related. And so right now you're going to hear from a success story, a cooperative that started to invest in these gender inclusive strategies to move from Drugar, from dried Ugandan Arabica, to something that was really more of a value addition activity for both men and women to improve their entire communities. So thank you. That's it. <laughs>